All righty, so let's go ahead and get started here. So again, my name is John Mullins, and I'm coming to you from Themis. Um, I not noticed a lot of the, I see, recognize a lot of the names out there from previous classes that I've taught, so welcome. Uh, good, to, good to see you again here today. And there's my email address up on the screen there, so jmullins at themisinc.com. Um, you can also see the, the Themis website there, themisinc.com. Also, um, there's a, a link there. You can follow us on Twitter at Themis Training as well. All right, so again, remember to use that question box over there if you have any questions this morning here. Let's go ahead and get started. We have a lot to talk about here. All right, here we go. All right, again, my name is John Mullins. Here's just a little bit about myself. So I recognize a lot of the names out there, but in case you're a person who hasn't had a class from me in the past, um, I have taught over 250 classes um, throughout the country and such, so chances are I've seen you somewhere along the line. Um, but I'm from Themis. Um, many of you are, th are familiar with Themis, not only for the Oracle training, but also for DB2 and Java, Linux, web type development as well. Um, I've been using Oracle for a little over 30 years, so I started back in 1985. Um, I worked at Boeing for 10 years, and one of the examples I'm going to use in the presentation today will kind of have to do with a factory floor example, and then Boeing kind of reminded me of that. I am an OCP DBA uh, and also a certified technical trainer, um, so I'll try to keep the presentation fairly fairly structured and such, just like our classes that we've had, so feel free to ask questions, take notes, and those types of things. And you can ask questions throughout or you can save them for the end as well. And like I said, make sure you could also send any questions to my email address, and there it is up there on the screen again as well, jmullins at themisinc.com. All right, um, if you're not familiar with Themis, they've been around for a long time providing quality training. A lot of you have had training classes with us before. Like I said, DB2, Oracle, Unix, Linux, Java, web development, and there's our website. You can also go out there at the website and see a schedule of classes as well. And I'm going to mention some of the classes that, that are kind of related to today's presentation as well. But, of course, the main thing we want to do is look at some of these SQL new features. All right, as far as things that will be related to what we're talking about, um, if you are interested, and you'll see some more information at the end, but we're talking about 12C new features today as related to SQL. Um, there is a, a 12C new features for developers on May 6th and 7th, and also on May 11th through 13th for DBA types. And then we have a whole range of other types of Oracle SQL, PL SQL, DBA, and those types of classes. So just, just be aware, those are all be hands-on. Uh, they're taught online, or we can come out to your site as well. All right, let's jump right in here and talk about what we're going to go through today. All right, so what we want to look at is, is at a couple of the 12C new features that are available to us as far as SQL goes. And I'm going to look at six uh, SQL features here. Um, two of them I'm going to spend a lot of time on. They're very powerful. Um, one of them in particular is something that we've been waiting on for a long time uh, as far as its capabilities and the vendors have had the cap other vendors have had the capability to do it before so we'll take a look at that now I'm gonna go through these six ex uh, different features the first one we're going to talk about is going to be row pattern matching and, and I'm going to go through five different examples with this row pattern uh, matching and you know at first glance when you take a look at these uh, row pattern matching examples that I have, you might look at them and say, well, they're all kind of the same. Um, but what I really want you to look at is the problem that they're trying to solve. And that's what makes these different. Um, the clauses and options that they have within themselves, yes, they're all uh, you know, fairly similar and such, but um, the problem they're trying to solve is distinctly different. Um, this row pattern matching you know, we may have had other alternative ways to doing this in the past, whether you use the model clause or whether you used regular expressions or even the like operator uh, to an extent. But you know, when we look at these, we're looking at matches not only within a column like we would do normally with a like operator, but we're looking at these patterns across one or more rows. So we're comparing one row to the next, to the next, to the next, depending on what options that we give it there. And this is really good for identifying trends, 
um, different patterns in our data, and, and the, I think these five examples will point this stuff out really well. Um, quality control, do we have any deficiencies? How are things going? What's our success rates? And, and a lot of times, if you're out there and Google row pattern matching for Oracle 12C, you're going to see a lot of the same examples out there. One of, one of the classic examples has to do with the stock market. You know, stock market prices for stocks are going to go up and down, and we're going to have trends based on various factors. Um, you'll see a lot of examples out there for the stock market just trying to identify, if, for example, if a stock price is going down, it hits its lowest price, then starts going back up. Okay, what was the, the date of that lowest price? What was that lowest price? What was the price it started to descend from? What was the price it went back up to? You'll see that example a lot. I'm not going to go through that example today. There's plenty of those out on the Internet. But I am going to show you five other types of examples that are available to us. Right now, when we look at the row pattern matching, there's going to be some new clauses and options that are available to us within our select statement. And you'll see these in the examples I'm going to go through here in just a few moments. Um, but I'm just going to mention a little bit about each of these right now, and then we'll see more detail about them shortly. Um, the match recognize, that's the main clause, and you'll see that in our select example coming up. That kind of gets the row pattern matching starting. So match recognize, that's the main clause. Now, within the match recognize, we're going to have all these other clauses available to us. Um, for, for the most part, most of these will be optional. So let me start with the partition by and the order by. Those are, those are the two simplest, most straightforward ones out of all these here. So if we do a select, select from whatever, and you'll see the example, we'll do a partition by maybe, and we'll also do a uh, order by maybe. It kind of depends on what we want to kind of do. Okay. The partition by it tells us what do we want to logically how do we want to logically group our data together? How do we want to logically partition it together? It's kind of like a group by clause. Okay? Um, we may or may not want to do that. It kind of depends on what kind of problem we're trying to solve. So partition by could be optional. The order by is really important, especially if we're doing the partition by. Uh, we can do the order by without the partition if we want. Um, the order by is how we're going to sort the data within each partition or within each group. That's not the order by for the entire result set. We could also have an order by for that. So this is the order by within each partition or within each group. All right. So those two are pretty straightforward there. Then we hit the measures clause, and this is where it starts to get a little bit more complex for us. Okay. The measures basically is going to define for us the relationship between input and output. Okay, our select statement, when we select from one or more tables, whatever that select statement is, that's the input into the row pattern matching. So whenever we do this, we have two things. We have input into the row pattern matching, and we have output from the row pattern matching. The selecting from your tables and views, that's the input. The output is after we do some pattern matching. What do we want to see, see if we do have a pattern match? And we're going to match those together in this measures clause. Um, hang on until you see an example that'll make more sense. Um, but that's all that's doing. It's 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 kind of correlating the input to the output. In other words, the in input might be a column from a table. The output might be um, based on that column from the table. Did it match to something? Do I want to show a matching date, a region, um, a combination of fields, a calculation, whatever it might be. And within that measures, we can also define, here's one of the big benefits of this. We're, we're really, as we get the input from our tables and views, and we're trying to match the patterns, we have the capability to, through a cursor, to walk through it row by row. We can go down row by row. We can go up row by row. So it gives us that cursor management of stepping through our data both directions, which is very powerful. And you'll see that in some of these measures uh, clauses coming up. The row pattern, rows per match clause, um, um, how many rows do we, when we find a match, how many rows do we want to display? It's kind of like the group by. Do we want to get uh, one row per match? That's the group by kind of uh, behavior. Or we could show all rows per match, which then that shows all the rows that went into the matching of the pattern there. So maybe we're trying to debug it and want more details. A lot of times you'll see the one row per match. Um, and then as part of that, 
you know, after I get a match, where do I resume my pattern matching? So there also will be a, and you'll see this coming up, an after match option as well. Okay, the pattern and the define, those are going to be big deals. We'll talk more about the pattern here in just a little bit. But the pattern is basically, okay, what are we looking for here? Okay, which variables am I going to be uh, analyzing? Um, how many number of rows um, do I need to match for the pattern that's coming up for those variables? What's the sequence that they need to be matched in? We're going to define that in the pattern clause. And then the, the define will actually define the actual pattern. You know, what am I looking for? I'm looking at these fields, and I'm looking at these rows in this order. What's the pattern I'm looking for? Is it uh, data values? Is it a trend of something going down or something going up or staying the same? Is it a, a decrease of a certain amount? What's going on there? We'll define that with the define itself. Okay. I see I had a question there in the, in the box there about the slides and the presentation. These will all be available um, on our website. So you can get the slides available on the website. You can also get uh, a recording of this presentation on the website as well. Um, that uh, URL will come up at the end, but it's basically going to be themisinc.com slash webinars. That's where you can get that from. All right, let's take a look. Let's get into this code here. All right, here's the data that I'm going to be using for the first few examples. It's just a attendance type of table. So I've got one, each row will represent a different date from last year, 2014. And then I've got this attendance figure, maybe for, for a museum or a zoo or whatever it might be. Here's the, here's the daily attendance out there. And we're going to start, we want to look for patterns in this attendance to kind of help us if we were the owner of that museum or the marketing department of that museum, we can kind of see trends in the attendance. You know, does it go up on weekends? How does it do on holidays? Um, we are going to be closed a certain number of days, like for Christmas and such. Um, and so we can kind of look in this attendance. Is the attendance going down? Is it going up? Why is it going down? How many days in a row has it been going down for? Those types of things. So this is the data we're going to be using here. Um, just a daily attendance. And here's our first problem that we want to solve. So I've got five of these examples. Uh, I'll go through them fairly quickly. It would be a really good idea if you could get a copy of these slides just so you have examples of these different things that you might look for in row pattern matching. Um, that's kind of one of our, one of the things I want you to take away from this is the type of problems you can solve with this feature. All right. So the first one here is I want to find patterns in my data where I have declining attendance of three straight days. Okay, three straight days is what I'm looking for here. And it's very specific, right? It's not four days or five days or two days. It's for three days in a row my attendance has gone down. And I want to identify those patterns and their dates so that I can go back later and analyze, okay, what's going on here? Why were they going down? Was the weather bad? I, I don't know, what was going on? Um, did we have a price increase recently? Um, why did the attendance go down? So here's to take a look at the code. When we fr first look at this code, it's going to look maybe a little bit daunting at first, right? We look at it and we say, wow, that, that looks kind of complicated. It, but as we go through here, it's really not that bad. It can, it can get bad. This certainly can be more complex. And I'm going to start off with simple examples today. Um, really to get us that understanding of what this does. So let's take a look. Let's just go through here kind of one by one type of thing. Okay, let me get a arrow here. All right, so, so we're going to start off here at the top, this select statement. Everybody should be able to see that okay. All right, select star from daily attendance. Remember, daily attendance was the name of my table. And again, this could be a much more complex statement here. It could be a join. It can have other conditions in it and whatever. Now, when you take a look at that, here's kind of the weird thing, and I don't know if we should really get hung up on this too much, but you're not really selecting the data from the table or the tables or the views at this point. This is That table there and any conditions that it has is only providing input to the row pattern matching. So the, in the overall at the end, what you're really selecting from is down here in the measures clause. Remember, the measures maps the input to the output. So I'm going to take the attendance date from the daily attendance 
uh, table in this case. I'm going to take the attendance right here from the daily attendance, and I'm going to map those to these three aliases here, high date, low attendance, and low date. So the selecting from here, this just provides the input to the row pattern matching. That's all it's doing at that point. Okay? So remember what the table looked like. It had an attendance date and an attendance. That's it. All right, here comes our match recognize clause. This kicks it all off. Notice it starts with an open paren, and down here it's going to end with a closed paren. All right, so we just get started there, and we come in. Now, we might have a partition by. We don't in this case. We might have an order by. We don't in this case. So we get right to the measures clause. Okay, so what do we want to see in our output? When I do a select asterisk right here, what I'm really selecting is this, this, and this not the columns from this table, okay? Now, they, they, may, they might map directly from a column in the table to the output, like here on attendance date. I'm really just selecting the attendance date and just displaying it as I read one row at a time. I'm not doing anything with it, okay? So again, the measures is your output. So in this case here, I'm going to see three columns in my output, one called high date, low attendance, and low date in this case. Okay, here I'm selecting the attendance date, which is no big deal. Now, don't worry about this A just yet, because we're going to define A down here in the pattern. You can name that whatever you want. A, B, you can give it a name if you want. Some people use start. Um, some people just say row, whatever. Row is kind of a reserve word. I wouldn't use that necessarily, but or record or, or data, whatever you want to call it. So here's A right here, and we're gonna, we, we might define it. If we don't define it, that just me, means... It just represents a row or record in our input. So a lot of people just use A for that. You can call it whatever you want. All right. All right. The last um, attribute that you see here, we see last. We also see down right here, too. Now, last is a keyword. La last happens to represent what's called a row pattern navigation function. And we could do things like last or first or next or previous. Okay, those are the things I talked about earlier where you could, you could cursor through your input data. You can go down rows or up rows, and, and depending on what I'm matching, in this place here, remember what we're matching on is three consecutive days where I had declining attendance. And when I hit that third day, guess what that is? That's my last day. And so what I'm saying here is I want to show the last attendance, and I also want to show the last attendance date in this pattern matching, okay? Because remember what I have here is I have a date and an attendance. Now the attendance is going down. The next thing would be the next date. Oh, it's still going down. Oh, go down to the next date. It's still going down. When I hit the bottom of that third, since, since I specifically want three days in declining attendance, that's going to be my last attendance. That'll be my last date. So that's the last whatever in your pattern match. Okay, you don't have to use last and first and next and previous, but if that's what you want to display, then do that. All right, followed by that, I think I'm going to tell it, do I want to do one row per match or all rows per match? And once I'm done matching, in other words, once I find three declining attendance days, what do you want me to, how, how should I proceed from there? In other words, with the next row. So after match, skip to next row in this case. There are a lot of different um, things to do that you could do after match. You'll see a few of them in these examples. All right, and then here's where it gets a little bit dicey down here in the uh, pattern clause and the define. These can be really simple or they can be complex. Okay. All right, so with our pattern clause, remember what we're going to identify here is basically. This is what's called our row pattern terms that are in these parentheses here. So A just represents a row from my input, which in this case is my daily attendance table. Okay, uh, and then I could just say B if I had, if I want to look at the next row or some other value for the next row, but here I'm defining another variable called down. Okay, I'm not sure that's a, I use down because we're trying to find attendances that are going down or declining. Um, you could call it whatever you want right here. All right, so you just separate these by spaces in here. So A represents the input row. So I'm looking at the attendance for a particular date. 
And then down has a definition that we're going to define down here, guess where, in our, in our define section. So here's the variable called down. What's the definition of down? Well, down is defined as this, an attendance right here that is going to be less than the previous attendance. Okay, and you can almost look at define down here, it's, it's almost like a where clause in most cases. In a lot of the examples I show you today, it will look just like a where clause. All right, so what I'm matching is I grab a row from A, which is a row from the daily attendance table, and I match it to what? The, I take the attendance and I try to see if it's less than the previous row that I just read. And if it is, I have a pattern match. Um, and then I'm going to continue that for three, I'm looking for three consecutive days. All right, now after the down here, you could, this is optional, but you have these series of what are called quantifiers, row pattern quantifiers. And here I got a what? A, cur a curly bracket, a three, and a curly bracket. That means I'm going to be looking for exactly three pattern matches. When I hit three, I stop. That's a match. I display, in this case, one row per match, and then I go on to the next pattern match looking for it. Um, other types of things that you can put in here, and you'll see this coming up on a slide in a second, but you can have an asterisk for zero or more matches, a plus sign for one or more matches, and so on. I'll show you those in the, coming up here in a few seconds. Um, had a question there in, in the, the box there about you know, I'm matching on three consecutive days of declining attendance. What if I had actually had four or five in that pattern? In this case, since I said just a curly bracket three, it's, it's going to stop when it hits three matches, even though there could be four, five, six, eight, ten matches of declining attendance there. Um, if I wanted to do three or more, then I could do um, a different match here. I could do a, a three comma inside the curly brackets. So I won't get two rows in this case. What I'll get is one match for every three rows of declining attendance, however many that happens to be out there. And if they happen to all be consecutive, then they'll show up as that being um, consecutive as well. Okay? All right, so take a look at that again. Remember, we're looking for um, patterns of declining attendance for three days in a row, and strictly three days because that's what we have right here. And remember, this part here is very important. If we then take a look at the output of what that looks like, let's go back to that. All right, let me get rid of my arrow key here. Okay. The output's going to look like this. Okay, so remember I selected the high date, the low date, and the low attendance. So as I went down three consecutive days of, of declining attendance, at the end of that three days, this right here, this 1,001, that's my lowest attendance in those three days. And the, the, the January 14th is the date for that 1,001. Now, the January 11th, we, you might look at this and say, well, January 11th to January 14th, that's really four days, isn't it? Well, the January 11th is where we started. And then from there, after that date, we had three days of declining. Okay, so that could be a little bit confusing there, but that's what I coded it for in this particular example. Okay, so these would be January 14th. Um, that's the lowest. I had three consecutive um, declining attendance dates leading up to that date. Now, if we go back to the previous, let's go back to here, just a little bit more on the measures and the pattern that we have. Remember, I mentioned you, in the measures clause, and you'll see this coming up too, we had one with last, but you could also mention previous, next, and first. In the pattern clause, here's those other quantifiers that I was mentioning. And we use the, what, we just used this last one down here at the bottom in this example the N exactly. So exactly how many matches do you want? Um, you could also, like I said, use the asterisk or the plus or the question mark for zero or, or one. Or we can use for you know, N or more, one or more, zero and M, whatever. Those would all be go into your pattern clause there. And you'll see that coming up on some examples here in a second too. All right, let's go into, I'm going to go through these examples here. Like I said, they're all kind of the same, but yet 
pretty different. Let's look at the second one here. This is really important. Uh, this is a good one too. Find patterns where there's a drop in attendance from one day to the next of more than 75%. So I'm, I'm going to be comparing just two rows, the current row to the next row. And if the attendance goes down more than 75%, it does a pattern match, and that's in my output. I'm not going to include uh, to dates where the museum or whatever is closed because those have zero attendance dates. I'm not interested in those. So take a look at my example here. Select star. What's my input to the pattern matching? I'm selecting from the daily attendance, but I'm only doing that where the attendance is not equal to zero because I don't want those zero dates. Match recognized, and then here comes my measures. I'm going to display the attendance date the attendance. Now notice on the attendance I have A and B here. These are important, these quantifiers on the front. A will be the row that I'm looking at. B will be the next row. And how do I know that? I'm going to define that down here at the bottom. And then I'm also going to display what? What the percentage of the drop was. So I'm going to take the attendances, subtract one, the second one from the first one, get me a percentage and display it. Okay, I'm going to get one row per match. <clears throat> Excuse me, and then after match, I'm going to skip to B. Okay, what is B? That's the second row, right? And how do we know that? We looked at here in the pattern. Now, notice here in the pattern, I just have an A and a B. No plus signs, no asterisks, no nothing. So what this says is I'm going to compare a row from A to a row from B. Just compare the current row to the next row. That's all it's saying there. Okay, what is B defined as? Well, B is going to be the percentage of the drop. So if the attendance is less than 75%, and you can see that there in my calculation, then I have a match. Okay, if I don't have a match, then I start with B and I look at the next row. If I don't have a match, I start with B and I go to the next row. If I have a match, then I start with B and I look at the next row still because I'm doing after match skip to B. Okay, the really good thing about learning these is we look at the syntax and it looks kind of complicated you know at first glance but what really helped as far as you're going through here and trying to learn this is just work with these measure things in here like if, how do I know whether to use an A or a first or a previous or whatever you know you can you're going to get what you ask for so if you ask for A that's just the the date of the row that I'm that was the input because that's why what, what I have A down here in the pattern is A so you can just kind of, you know, by trial and error, change these things around, change the B to a last or the A to a first, and see what gets displayed. Because remember, the measures is just your output. That's all it is. That's kind of a weird word for that. Because it sounds like we're, we're analyzing something, we're measuring something, but we're really not in that case. All right, and if we look at the output, it looks something like this. So what this is saying is, um, starting on, on January 5th, I had an attendance of 4707, and then on the next row, which would have been January 6th, and I could have also displayed that here too, the attendance was 1,118 for a drop of 76%. And then on March 9th, I also had a drop of more than 75% to March 10th of this to this, 84% drop. So it's only comparing two rows that are side by side. So in other words, if I go, if today is January 8th and January 9th, there's not a 75% drop, I start with January 9th and I look at January 10th to see I don't keep looking for that drop from the original date. I'm cursoring my way through here, step by step, row by row. Remember, one of the things you want to take away from today is what kind of problems can I solve with this feature? All right, let's look at a third example. Um, this, I like this. Calculate a uh, running total of attendance. Okay, what, what I want to do here is, and I chose 100,000. I'm going to create blocks of data um, adding up the attendances as I go from one date to the next, but I don't want to exceed 100,000 because maybe I want to block 100,000 to see how many, how many days did it take me to get to 100,000 in this month? How many days did it take me to get to 100,000 in the next month? Okay, so this one's pretty simple. Again, I'm just selecting everything from daily attendance. That's the input. I have an order by this time. I'm ordering by the attendance date. And what am I going to show my output? Remember, the measures is your output. I'm going to take the attendance date from the input, the first one, 
And I'm also going to display the last attendance date in the pattern match. So in other words, remember what I'm doing here. I read a date and I get the attendance. I read another date, the next row, and I get the attendance and I add the attendance together. Is that, is, is that addition or that sum, is it greater than 100,000? If it is, then I don't, don't accept that last date and I display what I've already matched to. In other words, I'm going to add attendance to attendance to attendance up till it gets to be more than 100,000. And then I'm going to show the first date in that group and the last date in that group along with what their attendance is added up to. And I'll get one row per match. And after I finish a match, I'm going to skip past the last row and start over. Now look at the pattern here. A just means take a, a row from the daily attendance as input. And remember the plus sign, what that meant, that meant one or more rows. So I'm just going to start reading one or more rows. Read a row, read the next row, read the next row, add up their attendances. If they're more than 100,000, stop. That's the end of your pattern match. Okay, and you can see down here in the define what I'm defining A as. A is the sum of the attendance as long as it's less than or equal to 100,000. Now, we look at this and we say, okay, that looks great. Let's look at the output. Here's what we get. So what this is saying is between January 1st and February 9th, the attendance was 98,506. If I would have added February 10th to it, it would have went over 100,000. So I don't, February 10th starts the next block. And so you can see the, the end dates and the start dates It'll be one day after another here. So I can kind of see that. And then if I wanted to, I could come back here and what? Change the calculations so I could do a subtraction between the last date and the first date to see how many days did it take to get to this. Okay. So again, there's the code there. All right. Very good. We're almost through these here. Okay. Um, if some of you travel a lot, and I travel quite a bit, um, and I've had this happen to me, maybe you've had it happen to you also, I might be leaving um, Austin, Texas in the morning on a certain date, and I use my debit card to get some money out of an ATM in Austin, but then three hours later, I use my debit card for something else, maybe for the hotel or for some food or whatever, but I'm in New York three hours later. Well, sometimes if we don't notify our credit card companies, That'll get flagged, and our second transaction will get declined until we call them and, hey, yes, it's me, I'm in New York, that's okay, and then they'll let it go through, and they'll say, next time, call us before, hey, and Mr. Mullins. So what we're looking for here is, in this data, this is a different table, credit card transactions. We're looking for patterns where the same credit card number was used physically in two different locations. In this case, we'll define location as a state on the same day. Okay, so let's take a look at our code here. Our table is called CC Trans for credit card transactions. We're going to do a partition this time by credit card number. So it's going to go out there for every distinct credit card number, create a different partition or a different group. And within that group for that card number, we're going to do a sort on transaction date and the location ID. Okay, what do we want to see in our output? I want to show the credit card number and the date. I want one row per match. After I get each match, what am I going to do? I'm just going to skip to the next row. And here's my pattern. I'm going to read a row from the credit card transaction table, and I'm going to compare it to one or more other rows. Remember, the plus sign meant one or more, and B just means the next row. Down here, we define B. What does B mean? This, remember, this is telling me how, how do I know that I have a match. I'm going to take the, the date that I just read, I'm going to compare it to the previous date to make sure they're the same. So I have two transactions on the same date. If they're the same date for those transactions and the location ID is different, then I have a match. That means I had a transaction in Austin on February 9th. On February 9th, I had also had a transaction in New York. The date matches, but New York and Austin don't match. And so then I'm going to display the credit card number and the transaction date for that match. And then after I find that match, I go to the next row. Now, in this case here, if I have more than one different location for that same date, it kind of goes back to the question that uh, you had earlier in the presentation, it will display multiple rows. So if I went, went to Austin, to New York, to New Jersey, to Connecticut, I might get one row for each of those different ones, or I will get one row for each of those. 
Okay. So again, if you look at the define, it kind of looks like a, again, like a, a where clause. Remember, the define is defining what is the pattern we're looking for. The pattern is telling us um, how many rows am I comparing from my input. All right, and then if we look at the output, it looks something like this. So I know that on March 3rd, I had multiple transactions for this credit card number in multiple locations. On March 4th, I had the same thing. Okay. So we like that. That's pretty cool. All right, let's then go back here and let's look at the last one, and then we'll move right on here. Yeah, there was a question there. If I go back here just real quick about A, because that gets a little bit confusing. Down here, I have A and B in the pattern match, but notice down here in the define, I don't have A. I only have B. So if I don't define one of these, and remember, these could be any names you want up here, but if I don't define something like A, that just, that just means that A represents the input row. There's, not, there's no, no where clause to apply to it. In other words, just read a row from the input, which means read a row from the credit card transactions, and then what I'm going to compare it to is the next row, which is B, one or more, with this definition down here for B. So A just means read the current row is all it means there. All right, good question. All right, last one here real quick, and then we'll, we'll move on. And we're, we're not too far from wrapping up here. What is the maximum consecutive number of days on the factory floor without an injury? You know, we have on a lot of the factories or warehouses, we have to keep track of injury days for, you know, certifications and things like that, for OSHA and things, whatever. Um, here's a real good example for that. So I'm selecting the max. I'm going to use an, an aggregate function here of, the, of a field called the consecutive days with zero injuries. And I'm defining that down here in the measures. Remember, this select up here, you're really selecting from what you have in measures, not from your actual tables up here. Factory injuries in the front clause, that's an actual table. It has a date. It has the number of injuries for that date. Match recognize. We're going to order by the work date. What are we going to measure? We're going to count um, the rows, and what are we going to count those rows for? For this pattern that we have right here, which I defined with the word zero, you could call it again, whatever you want, with an asterisk. And remember, an asterisk meant zero or more. Okay, what does zero mean? The word zero. That's what we have in the define right here. Zero means, for a particular record, I've had an injuries equal to zero. So he's going through this table called factory injuries. He's looking at it row by row. And if the injuries for that row is a zero, he increases the count. Okay? And he's doing that for what? If we look at the pattern, the, the asterisk says zero or more. So I hit zero, 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 zero. It'll count all those as four. And if I have an injury on the fifth date, that ends the pattern. Okay? And then if we look at the output here, the most days that I had in that table, consecutive days, was 54 days without a reported injury. Okay. Now there's a question there in the in the question box. There, yeah. There's also there's a, there can be what alternative ways to doing this as well. Um, the, the mention there in the question was about a stored procedure. And yeah, we could do this with a PL SQL stored procedure. That would be no problem as well. Remember, what one benefit that this row pattern matching gives us is he's always looking at the previous row, the current row, and the next row. He has a cursor in memory that he's going, he can go up and down on. In the PL SQL, unless I load these into an array or into an, a collection, the ability to go up and down isn't there through just a normal cursor. I can cursor row by row, go down, 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 but what if I want to go back to the previous row? I've got to keep track of that in a variable or an array or a collection. So, yeah, you could do it in PL SQL as well. Uh, Performance-wise, um, if you load these rows into arrays or collections in your PL SQL store procedure, I think the performance would be pretty similar. Because that's really what he's doing here. These are this is data. He's cursoring through it in memory on the server, in your PGA, in your private PGA there. 
So yeah, it'd be similar in performance if you were doing it that way. Now, if you're just not using arrays and collections and you're finding some other way to cursor through there, I think that this way you might see a performance gain doing this over the store procedure. But uh, again, it's, it's not necessarily, the benefit isn't necessarily the performance, it's the, the code itself giving you the capabilities or the functionality to go up and down in your cursor. All right, let's look at some other ones here. That one's the, kind of the big one that we really want to look at. And that row pattern matching, we can spend four hours on that. And there's a lot more to it than what I showed you there, but just remember some of the examples that we looked at and, and how those might apply to your environment and helping you answer some of your questions. Now, the other kind of big new feature with SQL in 12C is this row limiting clause. So we have this top end queries, and this is kind of something we've been wanting for a long time. Um, the other vendors have had it for a while, but this is where we're going to add the, the fetch first option or clause to our select statement to get the first n records of a certain criteria. And so um, let's take a look at a few of these. This will go a little bit quicker. We're just about ready to go through all these, but let's look at an example. Uh, return the five attendance dates with the highest attendances. So I want the, you know, which dates have the highest attendance, attendances out there. And so this is really pretty, pretty simple. So compared to the row pattern matching, this is a piece of cake. Select star from the daily attendance. We're going to order by attendance in uh, descending order. We're going to fetch the first five rows only. Now, if you've been doing this kind of queries in previous versions of Oracle, you know that you've always had workaround ways to do this, whether you did a, a subquery in the from clause with an order by in descending order, you use the row num pseudo column, which we know gets assigned prior to a sort, which is what its problem was, this is going to make your code much simpler and much more straightforward. You take a look at that, no, there's no subquery needed here, no row num needed here. Um, this will work just fine, and like I said, the other vendors have had this for a while. Fetch first five rows only. Now there's some other similar options that you can do with this. Um, what if I have ties? Fetch first five rows with ties. So what if the, in this case, the fifth attendance, there happened to be another attendance with the same amount. You know, on the previous one, we didn't see that sixth row. Here, we do see the sixth row, so we can add that with ties there as well. Like I said, these are pretty simple, so we'll go through them fairly quickly. All right, how's that look? Looks good. Uh, rather than getting the first number of rows, we could also do a percentage of rows. So we could do the first, fetch the first 3%, 5%, whatever, rows only. So, so depending on what the total number of rows is and the percentage that you want to get, you could get different number of rows each time there. Okay, so you have that option. And then you also have this, and this is kind of nice, where you can skip rows and show there. So you know, we did the fetch first um, five rows only, but now I want to skip those five rows and show the next three rows. So we can, this is kind of like cursoring through there as well. And again, you could do this in your store procedure with PLSQL, and it, and it might be easier for you to do it that way there as well, but this is certainly going to be less code. So I'm going to uh, skip the first five rows in this case and just display the, the next three rows of attendance in this case, of the highest attendances. Okay? So there we had the, the fetch first n rows only, we had it one with ties, we had one with uh, percentage, and then we had an offset as well. So I think that's great. It, it, the nice thing about that is it's super simple, right? All right, let's wrap these up here. Here's another one that you, don't, you may not have to do anything on this one. This makes it short and sweet, sweet. But if you have any code that's doing unions and union alls, um, the, the benefit or the change in 12C is now we can do concurrent execution of each of those branches in that union or union all. So each of the selects could be running in parallel. Now what we had before in prior versions of 12C is each individual select, if it had multiple parts like a sorting and looking for dirt, certain criteria or doing joins, it could do each individual select. It could break it into pieces and do a parallel execution on it, but it can only do one of the selects at a time. So that's what we're getting here is it could, if I had a select and a union and a select and a union and a select, it could do all three selects at the same time. Now, 
the thing here that could be a little bit confusing is that the second select could finish before the first select, and that's okay because they're all going to be merged together anyway, but just keep that in mind that they're not going to be done sequentially or get done sequen sequentially in order either. Now, this will be automatic to you if this parameter right here that you see in the middle of your screen called Optimizer Feature Enabled, if that's set to 12.1 um, or higher, okay, um, if it's set to 11 point something, then this feature isn't enabled by default. And if you want to override that, you'd have to use a hint that you see here on the bottom of the page. You could use this PQ concurrent uh, union hint. And then even if the optimizer feature is set to 11, um, it'll still do the concurrent execution of your branches there. Okay? All right, so that's kind of an automatic, that's a nice thing. There's a performance gain for you in 12C. Now, lastly here, we've got three others I put together on one slide just to kind of mention, oh, by the way, here's other, three other kind of simple things, maybe not as powerful, some of the things we looked at earlier, but with the truncate table, there's now a cascade option. So if I were to truncate a table or whatever, and that's a parent table, and I had a child foreign keys that pointed to it, you know, before you might get an error message there telling you about that. Here I can say cascade, and so not only will, will it truncate the parent table, but it will also truncate the child tables that are out there as well. If the foreign keys for those child tables have been defined with the on-delete cascade option, if they have not been defined with that on-delete cascade option, then the truncate table, even with the cascade, will still get an error message. Okay. People, a lot of people are always kind of weary of the cascade, even that on-delete cascade, because it kind of does this magical delete behind the scenes, and you're not always really sure how many records are being deleted and such. Um, this is, you know, a quick and dirty way, especially if this is the first step of like a batch job that you have at, that runs at night that goes out there, and you're going to refresh data in some tables. Okay, so that's a, that's kind of a cool one, very simple, just adding that. It runs with the on-delete cascade option with a foreign key. The last two things here are identity columns and invisible columns. All right, so identity column, this kind of has to do with sequences. So if you've been using sequences to populate like your primary key fields in tables in your insert statements or in triggers or whatever, you could now define that for primary key in a create table. So if you have the ability to create tables, that this would apply to you. But like here I have the transaction ID, and here we say generated as, and the keyword here is identity. What that does is it's going to create a sequence tied to that column in that table. So, so now it's actually part of the table definition. If you're familiar with sequences at all, you know that they're kind of an independent object that you kind of logically tie to a column within a table. But here we're actually doing it directly to the table here. Now, there's other options here we can do this. Right after the keyword identity in parentheses, we can also use those same options we have with sequences like start with and increment by um, as part of our options to use with this identity keyword right here. Okay. Yeah, so I see a question there about how do you how do you find what the, the current value that was just assigned from that identity there? And that would be, kind of, I guess, kind of a, maybe a, a con to this thing, because we're using regular sequence, we could always use, what, the curval pseudo column to find out the current value that was just assigned. Um, we don't have that here available to us. This is just making it you know, simpler code. It's, it's, not, it's a, not a separate object that we have to maintain and such. And so maybe the identity columns are a good thing for you, maybe um, not so much. But just be aware that they're available to you to use there. Okay. All right. Uh, invisible columns. Okay. I, I'm not quite sure on this invisible columns if, if I kind of am digging this or not. Um, you can make a column invisible to certain types of queries or commands. And so you could do that either with the create table command or you could do it later with an alter table command. Here you can see we're creating a table, we're making the social security number invisible. So we still load data into that column. So you know, 
typical commands or queries that will not be able to see that column SSN since now it's invisible. If I did a select asterisk from that table, it would not see the SSN. If I'm in SQL Plus and I do describe on the table, it won't see the SSN. If I'm in PL SQL and I use the percent row type attribute to create a, a, an array type variable, it will not see the SSN. But if I do this, select SSN from secure data, I'll be able to see it. <clears throat> so this only makes the, that column invisible to those queries that don't directly reference the column by name. That's all it's doing. Now we had other ways, we have other ways of course to hide columns too, whether it be through uh, database views for example, um, that would be probably the most common way through the Oracle's advanced security features. We could hide columns that way as well. This is just another way to do it. And you can make columns invisible or visible. You can flip back and forth between the two if you want. So I can do an alter table, whatever, SSN, modify SSN, make it invisible, and then modify SSN to make it visible again. All right, so there's three other new features that you could have in Oracle 12C. All right, so we had a chance today to kind of look at six different SQL features there. The most, the, the most complex one by far was the row pattern matching. We could see that there. And we know there's a lot of features there, but it also gives us a lot of flexibility to compare one row to the next and also look at the previous row versus the next row, compare one row to multiple rows. There's a lot we could do there, and that was really great. And I encourage you to get a copy of these slides so you have examples um, these examples in code that you can follow as well. Again, there's my email address, jmullins at themasync.com. You know, the, the fetch first was a really good feature there. Um, very simple to implement and such. The um, union, union all with the performance enhancements, nice. You know, you may not have to do anything and all of a sudden in 12C, all your unions and union all start to run faster. Hey, you know, who's going to fault that? Remember, related to the stuff we talked about today and some hands-on types of classes, uh, you know, May 6th and 7th, we have the new features for developers, 11th through 13th, new features for administrators. We have that available to you. If you want more information on this stuff, you can go to our website at themasinc.com. Um, John Cacavel will be more than happy to talk to you about scheduling classes or getting you in a class. If you want a copy of the slides and today's presentation as far as the recording goes, you can go to themasync.com slash webinars. And if you have any further questions, make sure you send those to me via email. I know we're a little bit over time here and I want to get you guys back to work or off to your lunch or wherever you happen to be going to. But thank you for attending today. You had really good questions. If there's any questions I didn't uh, get to in the question window there, feel free to send those to me in, in my email, jmullins at themasync.com. Um, I'll also go back and review the questions are there, and if I can get an email back to you, I will. Okay, so looking forward to some good things there in 12C. A lot of people have it already in non-production environments. Here's some things for you to try. Hopefully, they'll make your code simpler and faster. Thanks for attending today. Everybody have a good day and a good rest of your week, and hope to see you again in some of the classes that we have here at Themis.